five-time WWE Hall of Famer, Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Tito Santana. This is Kurt Angle. This is Brett the Hitman Hart, and this is going out to uh, Scott and Holly. You are listening to the Win Twice Wrestling Podcast with Scott and Holly. Oh, it's true. It's damn true. And this holds for everybody. Ho! Ladies and gentlemen, you are about to listen to the incomparable Win Twice Wrestling Podcast. With your hosts, Scott and Holly. We always go over, brother, and that's the bottom line. Dig it? So, sit back, relax, and prepare to be entertained. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 40 of the Win Twice Wrestling Podcast alongside your hosts, Scott and Holly. Hello. How you doing, Holly? I'm good. good I'm having a lovely time. Episode 40, it feels like we're getting into big boy numbers territory here. I mean, it's going to be, I keep thinking, oh, we're near the year anniversary of the, the podcast, which isn't too far away, because uh-huh. we started about, was it mid to late October? Yes. But because there are a few weeks out of sync in my head, we've hit every single week, which isn't quite right. So the fact that it's not going to tally up is going to really throw me. Yeah. But, we're, you know, still going strong, still yeah. having a lovely time. Aren't we? We're still in that period where we're trying to pick relatively short shows for review to make sure that we're still getting out some content yes. but obviously I'm away for a couple of weeks we need to make sure that bit's Outrageous behaviour. I know how dare I have annual I leave everyone else on team got it and it's my go and then when I come back not too long after you're my on go, leave yeah. so we're going to have to try and think of if we can fit anything in in terms mm-hmm. of getting a couple of extra ones in the bank for that as well however this episode that we're doing will be going out today mm-hmm. and then we'll be doing another one shortly thereafter to, mm-hmm. to tease people with Um, I guess this kind of goes in with a theme of some of the other shows where we're doing the first of all, the cherry popping uh, series of events, as you've started to call it. And it throws me off every time apart from (laughs) this Yeah, I basically came in, had to be mentally prepared for that because the last few times you've said it, it's just stopped me dead ass in my tracks. Okay. Um, But no, this time I thought I'd get ahead of the curve. I'll put it out there first. And uh, Holly, because I'm always the one doing the introductions, let's throw things over to your way. What? What are we covering in today's episode? <laughs> this just makes me so nervous. <laughs> uh, the first episode of Impact. Exactly. So we are dipping our toes. We've covered like the WWEs, the WWFs. I know it's the same company, but we've covered both mm-hmm. eras. WCW, AEW, Progress even. And now we're going to TNA. Mm. I have many thoughts on TNA in general. Okay. I feel like it's a very... It's a quite a unique company. I know most companies are unique in their own way, but TNA feels like it's a standalone unique company because it's gone through so many peaks and troughs since right. it came around in 2002 that at one point it was trying to be pushed as a competitor for the WWE. Realistically, it never was, um, and it never will be. What, if just because being... it's, it's a smaller faction? Yes and no. So... <sighs> Well, yeah, ultimately, yes. Uh-huh. But AEW just came in with more money so they could hit bigger names right off the bat. And yeah. they can, I mean, I don't know how profitable AEW is. I haven't looked into the books because, weirdly, I don't do their bookkeeping for them. No. But, uh, no, I know. Really? Shocker. But TK, give me a, give me a buzz. <laughs> I, I did the Which hand you, sign as well. You did. I did the Gabriel Jesus. Icky. Disgusting. <laughs> Disgusting. I'll give myself a really good thrashing later. But... TNA have gone through several different ownership groups and management behind the scenes. But effectively, what it was originally put out for was after WCW closed, um, there was. You're familiar with the work of Jeff Jarrett. Yeah. We've seen him in. Well, we've seen him in AEW even, but we've seen him as well in some of the WWF shows that we've covered, like Him and his damn guitar. Him and his damn guitar. Although, weirdly, I don't think in any of the shows we've covered, he's had his damn guitar. Oh, no, we did. Uh, Smackdown. Hmm. He came out with a guitar, didn't he? Of course he did. I keep forgetting that. But basically, when WCW went out of business because WWE purchased them, there were certain people that were just not going to get a job in the WWE. Mm -hmm. Jeff Jarrett being one of them. I think he was actually named specifically in the episode where Vince McMahon takes over and confirms that he owns WCW, said Jeff Jarrett's going to be fired, basically, straight out on air, because... I think Jarrett had a fairly tetchy relationship with Vince over the years. He was a man that went from WWF to WCW, back to WWF, back to WCW. Uh, it's boomerang. A, a little bit, but he also kind of not held them up for money, but I'm pretty sure he 
Well, he kind of did, actually, to be fair. So the second time he went to leave, he was the Intercontinental Champion, and they wanted him to drop it to China. And he said, well, if you want me to drop it to China, you're going to have to pay me an extra $200,000. Hmm. They did, and then Vince is like, Vince will not forget that kind of shit. Right. He's a nickel and dime kind of guy. Mm. And that's, uh, to be fair, anyone that gets to a certain level in the business world, you're going to have to... You have to be, you? you? do. You have to have like that kind of innate prickness with money. Um, which I'm not necessarily saying is a bad thing, because you know you get some people that are a bit more generous with it, but still when it comes down to the brass nuts and bolts of it, they're, they're going to be quite... And he said delirious there, but um, I can't think of the word I'm looking for. They're meticulous, that's the word I was okay. looking for, with the money. Um, he won't let that slide. So Jeff basically didn't have anywhere to go in terms of employment. Fortunately for him, his dad, so Jerry Jarrett, was a booker. I think he did kind of the Memphis area as well, along with Jerry the King, Lola, Tennessee. So it was a southern state worker. And I think at one point he actually, he was the man that bought out um, the Von Erichs for WCCW. Okay. Um, they basically decided, let's create our own promotion. Um, I think early doors they had vince russo in which is how the name tna got picked because obviously it's total non-stop non-stop action but when i say tna you it's an ass there you go that's very much a russoism oh, okay. so even though because a lot of, at the time a lot of people say what a stupid name for a company mm. because yeah it stands for total non-stop action but i felt like they got the initials and then tried to make a wrestling okay wrestling words fit into that rather than the other way around to see what it landed with and you'll see in a lot of their early shows what they did was they would have weekly pay-per-views. Right. So their entire bis- yeah. So their entire it would be reduced price from what you'd be paying for like the WWF at yeah. the time or WWE I think it would have been in 2002 by the time they got up and running. And I think they're about $9, $10 roughly mm. around that price, but again it's still weekly. And the type of people that they had on their shows were the likes of Scott Hall Kevin Nash's until they obviously both went. Actually, yeah. to be fair, I think at that point, Scott Hall might have left the WWF after the NWO bit and gone there. Um, but we had the likes of uh, Ron the Truth Killings. Yes. So, who mm-hmm. we see later on in this episode. But they also picked up a lot of the people that were on WCW contracts um, and were still new to the business. The likes of your Christopher Daniels, your AJ Styles. Um, obviously, they went on to bigger and better things afterwards as well. But they were like the linchpins of early TNA work. Which is why a lot of people now... Sorry, I'm blathering on a little bit for you, but I'm trying to give you a bit of a background yeah, yeah. promotion. But with the working relationship that the WWE has now with TNA, a lot of people are quite interested to... You know, you see people from NXT yes. going to TNA and then uh-huh, vice versa. Yeah. A lot of people want AJ to make an appearance back in TNA because sense, yeah. to most people, he is Mr. TNA. Mm-hmm. And rightly so. Um TNA obviously got investment later on from the Panda Energy Group. Um, so Dixie Carter and her dad, who I think is basically an energy oil tycoon type company, um, had involvement in and then Dixie got involved in the creative. TNA at one point, the head of creative for the company was Eric Bischoff and Hulk Hogan. Oh. Vince Russo had, a, I think, one... or He definitely had one stint. He might have had two stints uh, behind the creative side of TNA. So it feels like the identity of TNA mm-hmm. has never been one thing. Okay. It's been a number of things over years. So depending on what era you watch TNA, you can have a very different take on it. So now from what I understand, I don't watch Impact or TNA regularly yeah. anymore. I, so there was a period where I actually preferred it to the WWE in terms of the in-ring product. But that was probably about 2007, 2005, 6, 7, around that era. And Jamie, our editor, who I mm. reference fairly often, we went to TNA tapings when they used to do their UK tours. Okay. So TNA's biggest market was probably at one point the UK. They could sell out all their shows over here and they couldn't do that in the States. Um, so it was quite nice that it felt like almost, at one point in time, it felt like a homegrown company, weirdly. And that was the era when they had Samoa Joe, Kurt Angle, all those people working for them. So we got to see some good matches. We even saw Hulk Hogan and Sting come over okay. and, and work on their shows, which was, as a wrestling fan, given our age group, and because we don't live in the States... It feels like I thought I'd never see Hulk Hogan in a wrestling yeah. ring. And we did, because of TNA. So I'll always be grateful to them for, the, for that opportunity as a fan. Um, but that is to say that what I'm trying to ultimately get at is TNA was seen as the alternative in replacement of WCW, but it was never going to achieve those mm-hmm. levels. 
That was a, a lot of information for God, you. I don't remember what my question was. There wasn't a question. <laughs> I was just diving in with a little bit of background because, again, to peel back. Yeah, the I know creative. nothing. Like, I've seen clips later in life, like effectively, like recently and a couple of years ago, and I, I've, I've been like, oh, okay, and then, but I've never seen this. Yeah, some of my favourite matches that I've ever seen have been in TNA. Oh, okay. With the likes of AJ Styles, Christopher Daniels and Samoa Joe. They had a couple triple threats, one specifically, which is phenomenal. Mm. Pardon the pun, well, obviously with AJ oh, yeah. Styles. I didn't think <laughs> that, that wasn't intentional on my part. But at some point we have to review that show just because it's so good. Mm-hmm. So, so good. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's there's no wrestling that's off limits in terms of as long as we can get it legally, then oh, yeah. we'll cover pretty much anything. So this was actually suggested by <laughs> Jamie, though, to yes, be fair. I, I, at some point I was going to go down this road, but it seemed like a good a time as any because their initial taping schedule, it was an hour show, so this made it a 46-minute watch. Mm-hmm. Now, without putting the cart before the horse, it's yeah. safe to say they put a lot of shit into 46 minutes, didn't they, Holly? <laughs> yes. So I expected <laughs> you to be have a lot going on in your as you would call it your adhd brain yeah yeah but i thought you'd enjoy certain aspects of this and now i'm concerned are you that you might have really disliked (laughs) this episode but i guess we'll find out as we go into it so we'll we'll try so the episode um was done on the 4th of june 2004 the venue was the tna impact zone in orlando florida the attendance i actually couldn't find a figure for but it was based in universal studios Mm -hmm. so WCW at one point actually did some of their tapings to save taking all their gear on the road uh, but that meant that the audience that would go into their shows were people that were just visiting oh. Orlando Universal Studios so they weren't people that actually wrestling fans just people that are at I mean some studios. would have been wrestling yeah. fans but for the most part it was just whoever That's wanted to attend that was at the the park so oh. they never made any money from doing their shows like that it was all based on marketing um I will say though right off the bat I thought the audience for this were good they were loud. Yeah, they were good. Considering it didn't look packed, no, it was loud. Um, obviously, they would have had people in there going, yeah, cheer, cheer. cheer. Oh, but they, course. do you know what? I thought they delivered. They seemed to cheer at the right parts as mm-hmm. well, rather than just, oh, we haven't cheered for a while, let's go, hey. Yeah. So it seemed to work quite well on that front. Um, so I've got a bit of a well, I gave you kind of a whistle top, whistle a stop. whistle top. I didn't give you a whistle top. I don't know what that is. I gave you a whistle stop tour sure. of my experience of okay. TNA. But I have, as always, Ooh. come with a little bit of material to, to cover off. Okay. So I've got an introduction, which is from WrestlingCulture.com. Ooh. So it's a different... Oh my different, God, who are you? I know, it's not the sports day. Jeez, fact, you haven't the, used them in ages. I haven't used them for this one, and I haven't used them in the next one either, oh, I don't believe either. Your stocks and shares are going to drop. Yeah, I know. I like the fact that they have no fucking clue no, they that they're being referenced in this. <laughs> but I feel like it's important if I'm using material to make sure that I'm citing the right mm-hmm. source. So in the twilight years of the 20th century, the world of professional wrestling was dominated by colossal promotions that had turned theatrical sports into a global phenomenon. No pun intended. Foremost among these, among, among these, was the World Wrestling Federation, in brackets. <laughs> sorry. WWF. I'm so sorry. Known today as World Wrestling Entertainment, which had emerged victorious in the infamous Monday Night Wars, a fierce ratings battles primarily against World Championship Wrestling. Well, let's be fair, it was entirely against WCW. By the early 2000s, WWE stood virtually unopposed at the summit of the wrestling world, having acquired its erstwhile rivals WCW and Extreme Championship Wrestling. This consolidation under a single banner marked a new era, one seemingly bereft of competition, characterised by a singular narrative voice in the wrestling industry. And and this is not in the article, this is just me adding a little bit of context for you. WWE have always put their best stuff out there, historically speaking, when their feet have been held over the fire when they've got to react and make sure they're putting out good content. When there's no competition, they have... And this is probably the same with a lot of aspects of people and businesses in general. They coast, because there's no need to do anything more than coast. Um, However, the apparent tranquility was deceptive. Beneath the surface, there brewed a palpable discontent among fans and wrestlers alike. Critics argued that WWE's content had grown stale, too reliant on established stars whilst neglecting the... the nurturing of new talent. Fans longed for the diversity in storytelling and wrestling styles that had flourished during the days of fierce competition between multiple promotions. It was within this context of Monopoly and the craving for variety that total non-stop action wrestling was conceived. 
So you might have just heard what sounded like oh gunfire. God, I thought I was about to be shot. In the house, but I think a balloon has just popped downstairs. Oh, is that what and that I'm is? very much hoping that that is not my wife trying to decide to pop balloons whilst we're doing the <laughs> recording, which I don't think would be the case. So she's probably shat herself and thrown tea everywhere as well. Back to the article. Founded in 2002 by Jeff Jarrett, a former WWE star, and his father Jerry Jarrett, a seasoned wrestling promoter, TNA was born out of a desire to offer an alternative, not just in the form of another wrestling promotion, but as a different ethos in the presentation of professional wrestling. The Jarretts, alongside Bob Ryder, envisioned a promotion that would recapture the excitement and innovation that had been lost in the post-consolidation era. TNA aimed to break the mould, offering a product that was both familiar to long-time wrestling fans, yet fresh and innovative. I'm just going to pause momentarily there in the article, because when WCW went out of business, a lot of the fans, you'd expect that, okay, well now this is gone, these fans are going to move over to the WWF or go to another Mm -hmm. wrestling. I can't remember the exact stat, and I wish I remembered it for this purpose, but a good chunk of that audience never watched wrestling again. Really? When WCW went, they went, I'm done. Okay. I'm done with wrestling in total. So w, um, so TNA was there thinking, well, we can recapture these fans because we know what it is that they valued in the mm-hmm. professional wrestling presentation. Back to the article. From the outset, TNA set itself apart by reintroducing the wrestling world to a style that favoured athletic competition and technical prowess over the soap opera-esque sagas that had become a staple of late-era WWE broadcasts. Central to their philosophy was the creation of the X Division, a classification that eschewed traditional weight classes in favour of a no-limits approach to wrestling, emphasising high-flying moves, technical skill and fast-paced matches. Boy, fast pace is right. This was not just another wrestling category, it was a statement, a declaration that TNA would dare to be different. This is a very flattering article, I'll say that. Moreover, TNA sought to revive the spirit of regional wrestling promotions, focusing on building local talents and creating intimate connections with its audience. Tactics once ubiquitous in the days before wrestling's national and global consolidation. They planned to leverage the nostalgic allure of the National Wrestling Alliance and WA titles, grounding their emerging brand in the rich heritage of wrestling history while steering it towards uncharted territories. The founding goals of TNA were ambitious and clear, to provide an alternative to WWE's monolithic presence, to rekindle the competitive spirit of professional wrestling and to innovate within the sport's established traditions. That's easy for me to say. As TNA prepared to launch its first event, wrestling fans watched with bated breath, eager to see whether this new challenger would indeed bring a new dimension to the wrestling world, or if it would succumb to the shadows cast by the giants of its past. The stage was set for a new chapter in wrestling history, one that promoted, uh, sorry, one that promised to reignite the passion of fans and wrestlers alike. So that's where that article ends. Mm -hmm. It's very glorified, but it's very much setting out TNA as it was going to be a complete game changer. Now, I've got a couple of things that I disagree with in that article. Yes, the X Division was revolutionary in terms of the way it was present, it presented. Um, effectively, it's a continuation of the WCW Cruiserweight Division, but they added certain elements and dimensions to it, which did make it different and stand out. The bit I disagree with is where they said that it steps away from the soap opera side of things, because you won't have seen too much of it, a, a little bit of it in this episode, okay. but... The main event scene with Jeff Jarrett as the NWA champion was as soap opera-y as I could ever think of wrestling being. Like It was very WCW in the way it did things, so I don't think that was revolutionary anyway. But the undercard side of things usually had some very good matches on there, and that kind of carried it. And the main event, to me, always felt a bit meh. Right. Because I think if you were watching the show, let's say, week in, week out at this time... Your favourite type of matches, the high athletics, so yeah. the X Division style matches, yeah. were all on the underneath cut. So I think you would probably come away with the same thought pattern yeah. as myself. Um, so that's where I kind of slightly disagree with it. I've got a bit of information about the NWA and TNA partnership. Okay. So are you ready I'm to absorb here. this? I'm still here. I'm still following. You're going Just to sponge don't ask me any it questions. all in. Sponge, no, that's what, sponge it all in. You sponge it all yeah, in. I'll indeed. take it in like a sponge. But. If you do have any questions or anything, oh, do feel free to share. Don't you worry, I will. So, and not, this is separate from the article. I think this was from the same website, by the way, because I didn't specify, but I believe it was from the same website. Um, it was a smart move to tie themselves in with the NWA. Mm-hmm. We've covered a little bit of the NWA and the history of that, yeah. you know, whole organisation, but the fact it had fifty years of heritage behind it, to me, led instant credibility to TNA. 
because they've got the lineage of that title, the likes of Dusty Rhodes, Ric Flair, Harley Race, Luthers, all these people have held this title. Mm-hmm. So this promotion out the gates are linked with that organisation. So you go, okay, it's something. It's not going to be like a fly by night, then they're gone type yeah. promotion. So I thought that was quite clever. Eventually, it kind of handicapped them, and I think this article touches upon that a, a little bit. So. Oh, the words they're using in this article is delightful. In the nascent stages of its development, total non-stop action sought a unique approach to establish its credibility and historical linkage in the wrestling world. This was achieved through a strategic licensing agreement with the NWA, a storied organisation with deep roots in the history of professional wrestling. This partnership, which began at TNA's inception in 2002 and lasted until 2007, was pivotal in shaping the early identity and operations of TNA. The NWA, founded in 1948, had been a major force in the territorial days of professional wrestling, sanctioning world championships that were defended across various affiliated promotions. By aligning with the NWA, TNA was able to immediately present its championships, the NWA World Heavyweight Championship and the NWA World Tag Team Championship, as legitimate and prestigious titles. The agreement allowed TNA to leverage the historical significance and recognition of the NWA's championships, thus providing an instant boost to the new promotion's credibility among the wrestling fans. The primary benefit of this partnership was the legitimacy it conferred upon TNA. By featuring established titles like the NWA World Heavyweight title, TNA positioned itself as a continuation of a long wrestling tradition, appealing to both long-time and hardcore wrestling fans who respected the historical continuity of the sport. Furthermore, this alliance allowed TNA access to a broader network of talent affiliated with the NWA, enhancing its roster and enabling diverse, high-caliber matchups. This partnership also facilitated TNA's entry into the wrestling market at a time when competition was fierce and dominated by WWE. By show cu- showcasing, showcasing, show cu- that's like Mick Rawave. Showcasting. Showcasting. By showcasing NWA-sanctioned title matches, TNA could attract a segment of the wrestling audience that might otherwise be sceptical of a new wrestling entity. While the partnership with the NWA provided numerous initial benefits, it also came with limitations. The reliance on the NWA's branding and championship lineage meant that TNA was initially unable to develop its own titles and heritage, which could have fostered a stronger brand identity independent of the NWA's legacy. Additionally, the agreement sometimes restricted TNA's creative directions as title changes and storyline developments involving the championship had to be negotiated with and sometimes approved by NWA officials, which could complicate booking decisions and creative storytelling. So you'll be pleased to know there's just one more bit of update Mm -hmm. afterwards. But touching upon that point specifically, it makes sense because ultimately if you're using their property, they're going to have to be the ultimate ones that make the yay and nay call. And I believe, and I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure the title change, which NWA were like, we don't want this, mm. was when the title went to Abyss. They didn't want Abyss to be the NWA world champion because I assume they probably thought he was too much of a gimmick. Right. Whereas if you look at the lineage of the NWA, yeah, sure, they had characters and personalities, but they didn't have like these otherworldly type characters and individuals. So it'd be like they wouldn't have wanted like Kane or The Undertaker to have it for the same reason. Um, I just happened to pick two big guys there, but you kind of catch my my drift. They wanted people to be realistic, I guess, in their okay. presentation, and I think that was one that really caused an issue for them. And then they eventually branched off. So from here, we've got the creation of impact. So more specifically to do with what we're covering today, and this is from another website, oh. VoicesOfWrestling dot com. Wow, okay. I know. TNA Impact launched on. on I'll start that sentence again. TNA Impact launched on Fox Sports Network at 3pm ET on Friday, June 4th, 2004. As misguided as TNA's original weekly pay-per-view strategy was, it hid a more difficult truth. There wasn't an excess of television stations willing to jump in bed with pro wrestling since WCW Monday Nitro went off the air. For two years, TNA soldiered on, often with sub-10,000 people buying their weekly pay-per-views trying to build up enough footage and credibility to sell a TV show. Eventually, after two years of that failing model, TNA realised they needed to get on TV by any means. While they did have the syndicated Explosion show since the very early days of the company, that didn't have nearly the reach for TNA to grow and expand, so TNA struck a deal with FSN. TNA paid for a weekly Friday afternoon time slot on a 52-week deal. The, u- uh, sorry, the unusual time for two reasons... 
paying for time on a Friday afternoon was cheaper than in prime time or on the weekend, and it also meant TNA was substantially less likely to be preempted by the pesky sports part of FSN's name. To make their television ambitious, no, to make their television ambitions, TNA brought in a number of old well known TV stars like Randy Savage. Mm. Yeah, I didn't mention that to you, oh. did I? He was involved in some of their stuff. He was also on one of their pay-per-views in 2004. Oh, okay. Kevin Nash, Scott Hall and DDP. But despite being a modest rating success, especially for the time slot, TNA's FSN deal ended after the initial 52 weeks, leaving TNA facing down a summer without TV in 2005. As they sought a better home than paying for air on FSN, the internet... Oh, sorry, as... Yeah, full stop. The internet was then TNA's home long before the concept of broadcasting online was even remotely viable. As TNA stopped around, uh, sorry, shopped around for a new deal, instructions on the TNA's website informed you how to download a torrent client and watch Impact Online before also being available through Real Player after the first couple of weeks, where a neutral server load, where a neutral <laughs> server load disaster. That doesn't seem like a full sentence. Mm. Before also being available through Real Player after the first couple of weeks, were a natural server load disaster. Okay, so so many people going on there, it crashed yeah. it and didn't work. Fate handed TNA a saving grace. WWE Raw was returning to its old home of USA Network that October, leaving a big pro wrestling hole in their current broadcaster, Spike TV. WWE and Spike's relationship coming to a bitter, resentful end only benefited TNA as Spike took a punt on TNA and put them in the old 11pm ET Velocity time slot on Saturdays. TNA immediately began outperforming Velocity, regularly attracting 800,000 to 1 million viewers each week. The stabilised TNA as an organi- sorry, this stabilised TNA as an organisation and led to the company's longest sustained period of growth. They would get a primetime special in November 2005, move to Thursday the following April, move to primetime later in 2006 and expand to two hours in 2007. Along with expansion came some of the biggest stars in pro wrestling history to help bolster the ratings. Sting, Kurt Angle, Booker T, Christian Cage, Scott Steiner and Mick Foley and everybody else under the sun from the Bashams to Test to Rikishi. Mm. All signed for TNA from 2005 to 2008. TNA would establish a rock-solid role as a strong number two in the pro wrestling space, as the combination of homegrown acts like AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, the Motor City Machine Guns, James Storm, Bobby Roode, Abyss, Eric Young and Christopher Daniels would help complement the star power to give a diverse mix of past and present. I know why you're shaking your head. TNA finally reached the point all would hope for. The TV show was regularly attracting 1.3 to 1.9 million viewers. And the company reached profitability for the first time around 2008 and 2009. So all that grind up to that point, Mm -hmm. they weren't profitable. Slow and steady. Very much so. You'd think they'd be content with this. You would think a strong profitable number two with a consistent reliable television audience would be enough, but pro wrestling could never leave the 90s behind. The mentality of the Monday Night Wars loomed large over the way everybody thought and still thinks about the industry. The only way TNA could ever be considered truly successful was if they were in direct competition with WWE. Never was success on their own merits enough, only success in comparison to WWE. And compared to WWE, TNA was way behind, so they needed a big swing. A big swing that would change the trajectory of the company forever, for the worse. I've left it there because there'll be many other episodes where we cover TNA, okay. where I can cover exactly what went wrong. There. Okay. It's there's just the the same old story from wrestling in terms of enough is never enough. You could be quite content turning over a profit being number mm-hmm. two, but they're like, but there's number one out there. Yeah. Why can't we get to number one? Well. Look at history. Look at everyone else that's tried to reach number one and what ultimately happened to them. Sometimes it's a case of staying in your lane. And I'm not saying, you know, trying to ruin every entrepreneur out there. But sometimes it's best to make sure you control the controllable. Don't try and control what you can't impact on. And then overextending your reach and ultimately falling short. Which is what TNA did. And there's a few points in time where it was basically dead in the water. But obviously still going now. So it hung around. So it didn't completely kill it. That's all the, the background information I gave you. I wanted to give you because okay. you're like mm-hmm. a, a new babe into the world of TNA. 
Yes. So this was all very new to you. I wanted to make sure I gave you a little bit of thorough background. And that you did. And you only fell asleep four times. I know. So that's pretty good. And only yawned twice. So what was your favourite part of what I just <laughs> said? <laughs> no, it is interesting. And also it's better to tell me this information as soon as possible. Yes. I thought one thing that was interesting to me, because I never realised they hit those type of viewership numbers, mm. which is actually very impressive. Very I mean, good. WWE would probably take that now, to yeah. be quite frank. So it shows that, you know how different the landscape is. Um, and that kind of leads us into the opening of the show. Yes. So I've been talking a lot here, so no, I'm going to fine. pass the ball over to you Maybe. briefly. Don't worry. God. Don't worry. I'm not going to say, yeah, here, read my notes. Jesus. But you, like we said, you were unfamiliar with TNA. Yeah. What you did know of it, mm-hmm. what what kind of, you must have had something in your head for like the outlier of how the show was going to look or feel. What were you expecting, <sighs> like, or a comparison? What did you think it would feel like? I, d- I feel like because all I do know of it is later... Yeah, fair. So, to try and not come with like a preconceived idea, because I've I've seen, like I said, I've seen clips of it, but I'm much later on. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I know that's not what we're watching now. So also to kind of get rid of that sort of perspective and dial it back a bit. Yeah. What I did see was very confusing. <laughs> Confusing's fair. <laughs> couple questions off the back of that because and yes. to be fair, i kind of knew what your answer was going to be because you do try and go in as, I a, try. as a clean slate which yeah. isn't necessarily a bad thing no but i feel like even when people try and do that they still kind of have certain ideas of what they're going yeah. to see so my first two points are mm. when the show started i mean obviously i've got the usual breakdown where i go into bits and pieces on the aesthetics etc okay but from your perspective how did you feel seeing the arena seeing like the kind of the quality of the the show the footage so for full disclosure we didn't watch this on the tna app we watched it they've uploaded this full episode onto their youtube channel so we saw it through there so i don't know if there's like different versions of quality on there yeah as i said picture quality is not the best it's not the best but i don't know if i think to be fair that's probably more it's also indicative of the time exactly but what did so you think about? So we know I struggle with that, don't we? So what did you think about the um, the layout of the arena and the, the feel? Um, it was alright. It, to be fair, I think before it started, before it showed, say like the arena itself, in my head, I thought, I wonder if it's going to feel a bit like a like a house, not a house show, but I well, guess. like when we're at Progress. Yeah, kind okay. of like a lower funded yeah version of you know what we norm- are used to. Yeah. And then I guess you see the arena inside. And I was like, okay, so it's small. It wasn't jam-packed full. But there's a little bit of, like, theatrics. Yeah. Do you know, there, there is an entranceway. There's a, there's a bit of dry ice here and there. It's what I'd refer to as Napoleon Complex in wrestling. Okay. It's a smaller organisation that's trying to punch above its weight. So it's looking at the venue size. And that sounds derogatory, and I don't quite mean it in the way that it sounds. But they're, they've got their limitations... But they're showing, look, actually, we can still do the high-end stuff. We can do the kind of the video packages. We can do the pyro. We mm-hmm. can do that. We can make it feel bigger than it might actually be, mm. um, which can both give and detract, I think, from it. Because, well, I'm quite critical of what we see in the opening stages. But <laughs> before we go there, okay, the first thing, because I've never discussed this with you, oh, gosh. when you saw a six-sided ring, what went through your head? <laughs> I don't like it. You don't like it? No. What is it about it you don't like? It's because it's different. It's different. <laughs> but yeah, it's different. I just logically don't under- didn't understand how that would work. Okay. And what's the point? Well, okay, so twofold. It's unique. Well, is it? it's unique in America. Okay. It's basically the traditional ring setup that they have in Mexico. So right, if you've ever okay. most Mexican promotions will have a six sided ring. Okay. And I think in the US, it was straight away, it was a, look, this looks different from what yeah. you're used to. But that isn't originally what TNA used. If you actually, so we see some of the um, pay-per-view footage from their weekly shows. Yes. Four-sided ring. Yes, this is where I was Trez confused. Yeah, so that was the standard, because why wouldn't you? But yeah. then when they were kind of broadcasting to, you know, the mm. wider world, they wanted to say, look, we, we've got a different feel. So everything that we can make look different but still feel familiar, okay. they felt like it would set them apart. Mm-hmm. And it does give them more options. And I'll be honest, when I first saw it, my brain went, no, no, that's not four sides. Yeah, I can count. And that is definitely more than four. That yeah. is six. Um, and I'm not one to really watch. That's the one type of wrestling that I struggle with is Mexican wrestling because it feels more like a dance than it does a wrestling okay. contest to me. Or wrestling match, I should say. 
Um, but I kind of grew to like it. And then when they went away from it, I didn't like it. And right. then they went back to it. And then they went away from it again. Right. Okay. Uh, but it did present people, especially like when you think of the X Division and the type of people in there, it give, gave them more options on what they can and can't do okay. with having different angles effectively yeah. to work from. Maybe if I saw a different show with it, yeah. I'd make peace with it. I'm pretty sure there are some that you would, to the point where I almost forget that it's a thing. Yeah. Because it's so familiar to me, having seen TNO over the years, I almost didn't mention it in my notes because that's what I was used to yeah. seeing. Mm-hmm. And I thought, of course, to you, because we never discussed it. No. I thought, your brain must have gone, what the fuck is this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can count to six. but Show off. <laughs> but it took me a while to realise. I was like, something looks funky here. Oh, right. Especially because, yeah, the clip that we'd just seen, mm-hmm. to be fair, that clip shouldn't have been shown. Why? Because it gave me a really high expectation. A high expectation. I thought I'd re- I thought I as in like oh okay because of who you saw. Yeah, I thought oh this looks all right, and then. But is it so? I think in those clips it was like Scott Hall and stuff. No, there was one that's like oh I can't remember. I should have written it down better. But, but it, there was one that I watched and I was like oh that actually looks like this is going to be really decent. Okay. Yeah. Weird. See, I thought I looked at it and went oh this looks dated, when they had their. I mean we'll. We, We'll definitely mention about it as we go through the show because okay. I made notes of, of these kind of packages okay. that they showed us. But cool. right, we, we've done enough. We've yeah. set the table. Sure. The amuse bouches have been done. Oh, lovely. Starters, they've yep. been cleared. Mm-hmm. We're bringing out the main course. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't going to specify. I was going to say roast and then realise we were going to go down that avenue. So we'll go to a main course of your choosing. Oh, okay. So the show opening. So the show opens with a fast-paced highlight package that showcases some of the top talent of the time from the promotion. We see the likes of Abyss, AJ Styles, Amazing Red and others competing in high-octane action. This is accompanied by mid noughties grunge music. I liked it. Yeah. I did like it, I have to say. We also see one of the promotion's most inventive matches that has produced a number of memorable moments over the years, the Ultimate X match. But Holly, I'll save that information for when we see it in action on a show. Okay. As the video package culminates, we see the TNA Impact logo front and centre before we head to our next opening package. A voiceover that uses a similar soundboard and effects to what our show uses, by the way. It's like, (laughs) you are listening to the... I was like, what the fuck? This really threw me. Um, And it welcomes us to stage 21, I think they said, at Universal Studios. And once more, we see the TNA Impact logo on a big screen with a silhouetted audience pumping their fists into the air. We've seen a few different openings now. You mm. okay with this one? No. Nothing really to be offended yeah, by? No. Okay, fine. Before we go to the arena, we see monochrome real footage. This I didn't like. Mm-hmm. This was not good because it looked... They try to antiquate stuff that was very recent. I don't know what that word means. So make it old. Okay. So, because obviously they've used like this, like when I say real footage, it's like the... Oh, yeah, yeah. Going through the old time shit. Roll film, exactly. And they try and do it going side to side. Uh-huh on the screen but they're showing stuff that's only happened like within the last year mm. and it's done in a way that doesn't actually add anything to it for me you're not a fan no but they've tried to make it look we've been around for ages and yeah. i guess they you know were formed in 2002 but to me it didn't hit the right notes for me i go i'd go this is new this is something exciting okay. i would show it in color make it look as bright and colorful mm-hmm. and so someone goes oh okay to me it went it did the opposite switched you it off. switched me off a little okay. bit to it so um, uh, of more TNA wrestlers such as Raven, Monty Brown, who you won't have seen before, and AJ Styles once more in action. A green laser light show and Limp Dick Pyro welcomes us to the start of the event. Honestly, lads, have a word with the crew on this display as it was shocking. It was like a little... Pff, pff, it was like puffing dust. <laughs> a little Catherine Will. It was honestly, it was so bad. So, so bad. Before we go any further, Holly, let me know your thoughts on the Six-Sided Ring. We've covered it. We will move on. We hear the voice of Mike Tanay, who kicks things off by welcoming us and sends us right into our first match of the evening. It's very hard to hear him, I'll be honest. It was, but at least you know who he is now because we just saw him yes. on WCW Thunder. Yes. And to be fair to Mike Tanay, I will say this actually. So the person he's with, we see him later on, I mentioned him, Don West. Mm. Those two as a pairing, for they're really good. I'm sure people, I know people didn't particularly care for Don West sometimes, but as a pairing, because you've got Mike Tanay, who's very straight-laced, proper. He does get excited with his voice, but he never goes 
over the top, whereas Don, mm. Don West is like, oh, you doing it? And it like really balances the two well together, the okay. yin and yang. Yeah. Um, I I like the two together. And Don West actually passed away a couple of years ago, which is, is right. quite sad because um, it was before his time. First match of the evening, Holly. Uh huh. So you were a bit ahead of me in the the running order of this show. You started watching it before me, and oh, you it said, is, yes. "I don't understand this match." And I thought, "Well, I know TNA did some fucking weird matches." Yeah. And I mentioned a reverse battle royal. Yeah. I hope now if someone wants to punish us, pick a show oh. with a reverse battle royal on because how do you do it in reverse? Everyone starts outside the ring and you well, fight your to way to get, get in. into the ring. <laughs> it's ludicrous. I know Vince Russo. <laughs> what the fuck? And I know he was there at the time because we see him later on. So I thought, so oh my bizarre. god, they, no way they start with a reverse battle no. royal. Turns out what it was was a six man tag, and <laughs> no. I was like, why is she confused? I just, I, oh yeah. So. You knew um, uh, at least one person in this match. I think you know two people in this match. Right. Okay. I've only got one written down. Okay. So... And I don't even know if it's him. Okay. Bobby Roode. Yes. That's it. The other person you know is Eric Young, the guy with the blonde hair. He was part of Sanity in WWE. So he was with, it was him, Nikki Cross, Killian Dane, and uh, what was his, not Axel Dieter, that's um, the other guy. Oh, wow. I really can't remember his name blonde Mohican guy we've seen him in progress we literally saw him last time we were in progress <laughs> against your boy Mike DeVecchio oh him oh they were the group okay. Sanity right in okay. WWE they were really good in NXT right fucking awful on the main roster Eric Young headed up that group okay. so this is in his Team Canada days oh, the rest okay. of them I wouldn't expect you to know thank to god okay. but whenever in this show and I try and do it in general if it's your first time seeing them unless yeah. I really don't give a flying fuck, which yeah. will happen occasionally. Mm. I'll give you a little snippet just oh, so you okay. can kind of know what's going on there. Sure. And I'll try and specifically find something that will be of interest to you. Okay. So it's Team Canada, which is Bobby Roode, Petey Williams and Eric Young with Scott Demore against Team International. Good team name, that. Which is Amazing Red, American. Sanjay Dutt, pretty sure born in America. And Hector Garza. Okay. Okay. Well, Holly, I know you're familiar with two of the men, one apparently, <laughs> on Team Canada in Rude and Young, mm. but my, there was honestly a point where I thought, I, was like, I don't know if you'll recognise that as being Bobby Rude. Yeah, I did, yeah. Um, so my guess is you'll know little of Petey Williams. Um, so Petey Williams was the guy on Team Canada that wasn't Bobby Rude or Eric Young. Okay. So Petey Williams was a fun X Division worker who was the first person I ever saw hit a Canadian's destroyer, which blew my mind at the time. Mm. I'd never seen a move like that before. Okay. You know what I mean by the Canadian yeah. Destroyer, the flip pile driver. We see like Adam Cole uh-huh. do it these days and stuff. P.T. Williams was I'm the first. Fan, I'll be honest, no, I know. Yeah. And I understand why. Yeah. But that was the first person I ever saw do it. And I don't know if he, I, uh, probably talking about out my ass on this one, but I don't know if he was the person that popularised the move because I know it was a Canadian Destroyer. And the reason it was a Canadian Destroyer is because it was him doing it in and Team he's Canada. Canadian. Okay. Exactly. Um, he would later go around in TNA with Scott Steiner. And cut his hair in the same manner, grew the same facial hair, and wore the same chainmail, whilst being referred to as Little Petey Pump. Because oh, obviously Scott Steiner's big papa pump. Yeah. Little Petey Pump. And honestly, a side by side of them together, it looks like you've shrunk Scott Steiner in the wash. Oh, does it work? Fucking brilliant. Okay. But it was took away his identity. Uh-huh. But he really made it work. He really made it work. And he was one that I always thought was kind of underutilised, to be fair. Because he was such a solid worker, it's just such, he was small in stature. If he was around now at this age, I'm convinced he'd be in, easily in NXT, if not AEW. He he was good. Like his matches, I enjoyed. Okay. And he had good character work as well. Like one thing which I don't think we saw him do in this match, which was a staple he used to do, he'd hang someone upside down in the tree of woe in the corner. Mm. He'd stand on the middle rope, put one foot on their bollocks, and go. Oh, Canada. Like, I see the Canadian National Anthem while standing on their dick. Really likes it. Found it amusing. So that's a little bit on okay. P.T. Williams for you. Scott Damore, the man you saw screaming into the camera, looking as though he was about to have a heart attack, did a lot of creative work for the promotion over the years, and I believe he's still currently there, which isn't actually true. He fairly recently left. So there was a promo he did when TNA Impact, or TNA became its own identity again, uh, and he said... We're fucking back! And screamed it down the camera and then he's gone. 
But right. it's because it wasn't like he was kicked out the door. Basically said the creative differences he saw with the people there wasn't what he envisioned. So he just thought, fair enough, guys. You carry on with it. I'll go my own way. He recently got interviewed on um, Chris Van Vliet. Mm. And yeah, quite an interesting interview. Okay. Now onto the other side of the fence. We have Amazing Red, mm. who was one of the first workers in the original ROH shows. I think he was in the first ever ROH match. Is he like 12? He looks perpetually young. Even when he's like in his mid-30s, he looks young. He's got baby face. Yeah, he does. But he's very athletic and he's a bit of a ragdoll that people can kind of throw around. But he, I'm pretty sure... Now, don't speak out of turn. I feel like the first ever Ring of Honor match was Amazing Red against Jay Briscoe. Of the Briscoe brothers who passed away, sadly. Um, And it was a fun match. And I think at the time, Amazing Red was 18. Jeez. Because he was, what, 21 here? So he'd have been 18 or 19 Baby. in that match. So I'm pretty sure I picked up on commentary. They said that's how old he was. Um, where do I go from here? <laughs> uh, he was also a mainstay in TNA as well as a num- uh, for a number of years. Sonjay Dutt, I associate almost entirely with TNA, and he was a solid X-Division worker. Um, I uh, <laughs> Okay, this is the comment I've got here, because it's true. So Sanjay Dutt, I associate almost entirely with TNA, and he was a solid X Division worker with equally solid "I Am From India" entrance theme music. It's just you can hear the sitar, isn't it? That right, um, yeah. musical instrument. And you're like, oh, okay. It's like the same with like but Jinder Mahal comes yeah. out, you, or any like Japanese worker yeah. in. They've all got a similar theme, which I don't necessarily mind actually. But it's just straight away you go, I wonder who. Okay, so that I know what country they're going to be from, but that's about it. Well, okay, Hector Garza, you won't know. I mean, I barely know, mm-hmm. if I'm being perfectly honest. But his nephew, you will, Angel Garza, in WWE. Oh. Yeah, that's his uncle. Hector Garza actually died uh, about 12 years ago. Right. Um, way before his time. I think it, I don't know if it was a heart-related condition, or I don't think it was suicide. I don't want to put it out there if that wasn't the case, but I know it was a premature death that mm-hmm. no one saw coming. But he's a big, big meaty lad, isn't he? I'm fully expecting this to be outright chaos for mm. my notes, and here goes. <laughs> I'll try and follow, but this was painful for me. Well, so why was it painful? It's oh, just the pace they worked? Go- there's too much going on. I know it's just three people against three people. So it's quick maths. Six people. But so You can't just six <laughs> loads in this episode. I <laughs> know, oh, no higher though. <laughs> it's just, I think, because also still the setup of this new ring thing for me as well. It's like, hang on. And they and they don't stay in one place. They just they're all over the sh- fucking place. It's interesting because I'd say the general pace of the matches we saw at Progress was probably one of our most tricky shows to cover. Yeah, AEW All In would have been similar, but we had a different viewing method for that one. We did that live yes. at the time. Um, so yeah, in multi man matches, it can mm-hmm. be chaos, and that's why I was concerned because I look at the people in there. I was like, yeah. There are some very quick people with the yeah. likes of Peter Williams can be quick. Sanjay Dutt can be quick. Amazing Red can be quick. Yeah. Bobby Roode, Eric Young, not so much. Angel Gar, sorry, Angel Garza, I'm calling him that now. Hector Garza, again, not so much. Yeah, I think it was also for me as well as like, I looked at this and I just went, I only know one person. Yeah. So how do I notate who oh, they yeah. are? So what? how did you distinguish between Well, them? luckily, Amazing Red, I worked out who he was. Sanjay was Dutt, the child. I hope. Um... Yeah, but it was Team Canada was the issue. So okay. I've just written Canada. Brilliant. So every time Canada's tagged in, Canada's, Canada's tagged, tagged in. in. Canada's tagged and in. And out as well. It's amazing. <laughs> as predicted, the bell sounds and both Dutts and Red hit running sentons over the ropes to wipe out members of Team Canada. Moments later, Gaza hit a corkscrew body press over the top of his own and everyone is down. Match has just died. <laughs> Sanjay and Young are back in the ring and Dutt is firing away with right hands. Reversal of a whip sees Sanjay hit a double revolution satellite head scissors on the Canadian, which the crowd really enjoys, and I expect you did as well, Holly. I did. I now notice that non-title matches have a ticking Fox Sports Network timer across the top of the screen. So that's another hurdle for the ADHD brain of Holly to contend with. <laughs> yeah, it really was, because I found myself just looking at this timer, and I'm like, no, <laughs> look at the fucking match. Mike Tanay informs us that there will be 10-minute time limit matches, um, except for title matches, which will get 30 minutes. Good to know. Apparently, there will be judges involved if there are any draws. Not sure I like that personally. Mm. Just have it as a draw. Yeah. Because I don't care. Also, how could you have a draw? Well, time limit. You win or lose. Oh, yeah, fine. Amazing Red gets the tag, and he and Dutt hit dual drop toe holds on Young before they hit baseball slide drop kicks to the temples. In addition to the ticker at the top of the screen, 
We now have one at the bottom, and this is officially cluttered. This it was a lot. Because it's like a sports show where on ESPN, basically, where you're reading... You've got the banner yeah. that goes across being like, oh, so-and-so's just signed for so-and-so, yeah. but it's just, just leave me alone. And it just... basically said that I think Jeff Jarrett was the new champion and then yeah. he'd be defending against Ron the Truth Killings. That was the gist of it. Flurry of right hands from Red, but the whip attempt is reversed and he runs into the knee of Rude on the apron before staggering into a backbreaker from Young. Young incites Team International, and as the ref is distracted, all of Team Canada lay in the boots to Red. Rude, now the legal man, picks up Red and runs him back first into the buckles, where he continues to drive the shoulder into the midsection. Rude ducks too early off the whip and eats a kick, but back elbows Red to the canvas on the charge that follows. Elbow drop and knee drop from Rude gets a two count. Frustrated at not getting the three, Rude opens up with mounted rights to the top of the head. Body slam by Rude, who tags in PT. Rude wheelbarrows Red up into the air and PT connects with a top rope bulldog. Nice move that. Mm. Near fall. Don West is singing the praises of Williams on commentary saying he has been an excellent captain for the team. Fair enough. Side rush and leg sweep by PT who pops back to his feet staring at the opposition corner. PT drapes Red over the middle rope before inciting Team International and Demore takes the opportunity to club Red on the back. Williams stamps away on Red as the crowd begin chanting USA! but not in a pro-American way, in an anti-Canadian way. Modified camel clutch by PT as Rude tells the crowd to be quiet, which only makes them louder. Rude now back in and hits a nice delayed suplex before knocking Garza and Dutt off the apron. He makes the cover, but Garza drags him off by his ankle. PT tagged back in and he and Rude drop Red with double back elbows. Eric Young, the legal man, and PT looks to set Red up for a move off the ropes, but it's countered into a satellite head scissors on PT and a DDT on Young. Not bad. Red finds himself in the wrong part of town and there's an awful camera cut into the crowd as he avoids PT before we see him roll under a young clothesline and make the tag to Garza. I was not happy about that. No. They just pan away. I was like, why? Yeah, just leave, it. Just leave the camera there. Nothing interesting happened in the crowd either. No. Garza comes in... Uh, sorry, Garza comes in hot and clotheslines all of Team Canada before a tilt-a-well slam on PT Connects. Rude shows that he is no mug as he boots Garza in the gut and hits a very pretty sit-out powerbomb. Before he can capitalise, we see Dutt flip from the top rope one way before sending Rude in the opposite direction off a Hurricane Runner. You like that? Yeah. Oh, you're not overly... I, I really struggled here. Okay. Young cuts the celebration short as he clubs Dutt from behind and scoops him up in the wheelbarrow position before releasing and connecting with a neck breaker. Can't remember the name of it, but that was his finishing move, I'm pretty sure. Okay. You didn't like it? No. But it was just a... It was safe. It wasn't like he landed. I know, I know. Okay. I know. It doesn't, doesn't have to be unsafe for me to not like it. No, true. This next little series you won't be a fan of. So, red back in the mm -hmm. frame now, and he hits a code red. So, if you ever heard, you know the phrase code red. Yeah. That's because that's his move. On young for the one, two, no. Petey breaks the pin up before driving red head first into the canvas with a Canadian destroyer. I hate that. So Beautiful. Much. It was really good. Oh, that's horrible. Garza now in the ring and he throws PT with a release overhead powerbomb. Awkward moment as Garza realises he was stood in the wrong place to get tripped up, so he kindly moves into position so he can be dragged out of the ring. Duck climbs the ropes but gets crotched by Rude, who's landing heavy forearms to his back. He sets up for the razor's edge, but as he pushes him up, Duck counters with a hurricane runner. Nice. Garza sees how Rude has landed and heads up to connect with a twisting sent on for the one, two, three. Team International win the first ever match on TNA Impact. Holly, what were your thoughts on the match and what did you score it? Oh, I was a little bit overwhelmed. I'll yeah, be emotionally. Yeah, always. Yeah, there was just a lot going on. And like, I actually think if I'd have just had a plain screen to watch it on, it'd have been better. Do but you I mean think without the, the ticker timers tapes? Okay. and all of that shite. Um,. Again, it's like it's a full for me. It's a full on match to throw this new ring in for me as well. Okay, so it was an assault of the senses. Basically. Yeah, and like there's one point. I think that's why I started not liking the six sided ring because there's one point where someone goes to whip someone off the ropes and they don't run in a straight line. Yeah, they that run was just towards dumb. it and then go. Oh shit! I need to run towards the ropes, and it's like oh, so stupid. But that wasn't a six-sided ring thing. That was a. Oh, I know that was a because there's always the opposite. A placing, I yeah. get that. But you know, when you just logically, I'm just like, oh, okay, right. Okay. I don't know. I just, it, it was a. It was a lot. There was a lot of content for my little brain. Okay. So I gave it two out of five. 
Okay, that's not as bad so, as I thought you could have done. No, I, I, I did have to take my personal preference, I think, out the window and just give it some score. I gave it a three. Because I thought wow. the, the moves in there are actually quite light. <laughs> okay. And I also knew pretty much... The only one I was fairly unfamiliar with was Hector Garza. I haven't seen too much of him. Okay. But I knew everyone else in there, so that wasn't an issue for me. I was familiar with the six-sided ring. Yeah. And like the moves in there in general were pretty good. There was yeah. only a couple of bits where I was like, nah. And it was just about the right timing as well, I thought. Okay. It didn't go too long, wasn't too short. So three, I don't think that's an unreasonable score. Okay, yeah, fine. When we return from the commercial break, we go to the announce desk where we see Mike Tanay and Don West discuss how TNA have been available every week since 2002 on pay-per-view, and now they're on Fox Sports Network. Don tells us about staple of TNA, the X Division, where it isn't about weight limits, it's about no limits. I love that as a phrase. I think that's a really yeah. good bit of marketing. And I could be wrong, but I think um, Tanay actually mentions it in one of those cutaways that they do later on, where he said he just said it as a throwaway line in a match and it's actually it's quite apropos it's fitting Tanay tells us about the 50 year history of the NWA title which is a clever idea as it makes TNA which had only been around for two years at this point seem more prestigious which is what I mentioned yeah. earlier now we're shown some footage from the history of TNA and we start with Toby Keith singing on stage <laughs> getting shoved by Jeff Jarrett who storms his way to the ring Holly are you a fan of Toby Keith? Well, no. Seems like the music that would tickle your audio canal. Yeah, yeah. So not right. a fan. I, d I mean, I don't. I don't know who he is. You don't know Toby Keith? No, I don't well, actually. Hell. I That's know. Right. Call me a house. call me a country fan. I've I never know. heard of him. <laughs> call you a what? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so later on, we see Toby Keith enter the TNA equivalent of the Royal Rumble, and he hits a damn near perfect suplex mm. on Jeff Jarrett, before eliminating him from the contest with Scott Hall. Mm. Now we see Johnny Fairplay in the clutches of Chicago Bears legend Brian Erlacher, who presses the pipsqueak clean over his head, and then it just ends. So the thing to note here, Holly, they aren't showcasing the wrestlers in prime no. positions in these highlights. They're showing the celebrity involvement to make them appear to be a credible outfit. The WWF would do the same. And for me, that's not what you want to be selling people on. No. You want to be showing the people, the athletes that are going to bring them back week in, week out. That's what I'd be doing. Maybe that's more for me. I'm not saying that there's no added value with celebrities, but don't use it as the main selling point. No. And to be fair to them, this is the only bit in this episode where they kind of do that, but I felt like it was a wasted effort, mm -hmm. personally. We hear Tanay say that this highlights the unpredictable nature of TNA wrestling, and for some reason we're now shown monochrome and real footage again of Abyss laying waste to AJ Styles. No idea why that was tacked on here, but okay, because they didn't discuss it. Yeah, there's no, there's no thought process behind it. Match... Number two. Oh, that's fucking stupid. Shark Boy versus Abyss. Honestly, this this is you know when I watched this because I put a message in our little group thing. This oh, I wish I'd had a drink. So bad. Holly, have you heard of the man who hails from Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea? Shark Boy. No. Shark Boy is a really stupid gimmick, but to give the man some credit, he did play it very well, especially later on in his TNA career, where he took on stone cold mannerisms. <laughs> he even came out with a waistcoat jacket mm. on, would do all the head shaking that okay. Austin would do, and it was actually quite comical. Um, but he's, that I'm sure I would find funny. This is not. He's got a limit to him, he's got a ceiling on him, but if you look at him just in the context of being an X Division worker, which he was, yeah. it's fine. Okay. Um, but I knew that would be the first time mm. you've ever seen him, which just, as soon as I saw him come out, I was like, I'm so happy. <laughs> I'm so, so happy. I can tell by your face, Holly, that you're not sold, but let's no. see how you feel after you've seen him a few times. Mm -hmm. Now, the footage from a moment ago makes sense as we see Shark Boy will be taking on Abyss. I think, oh, sorry, I take it this is your first time seeing Abyss as of well. Of course it is. <laughs> I really wanted him to come to the WWE and have a feud with The Undertaker. Did you? Very much so. Abyss was the monster of TNA and was actually a very good worker in his own right. He had a unique character that worked really well as both a face and as a heel and had some of the most memorable matches in the history of the company. Christopher Park, the man behind the mask, is now signed to WWE and works as a producer behind the scenes. Oh, okay. So he did get to the WWE, just not in the capacity I was hoping for. Right. Um, I thought, because he genuinely a good worker as well. He wasn't just a big clunky man. Even yeah. you see in this match, what he does, on point. Um, but he had a good, unique look to him. He could do like the more dangerous kind of hardcore stuff as well. He had feuds with the likes of Raven. Hmm. Um, his, some of the stuff he did with AJ Styles was pretty brutal as well. Um, but 
Yeah, and it showed, because at first he was just basically a heel, mm-hmm. but then he showed that he could be kind of like a goofy face as well, and you think that wouldn't work. Yeah. And sometimes it didn't, but oftentimes it did. So he had depth of character there as well. And one thing about Abyss that um, would be of particular interest to you, there was a company, you can see some of their DVDs up there on my shelf, 1PW. Yeah. Um, it was a UK-based promotion that mainly did their stuff in Doncaster, so up north, and they used to get some american imports in abyss was one of the ones that they frequently got in alongside a man called sterling james keenan you don't know who sterling james keenan is better known later in life as Corey graves oh and Corey graves oh used to be gosh. the one to control the monster so abyss oh, was wow. his personal monster and this is when Corey graves had long hair okay yeah looked a bit dirty looked a bit like your sort um <laughs> Stop it. so yeah um I'll have to actually try and get us to watch one of them at some point. Yeah. That would just be quite fun to see. And I'd find one specifically with Sterling James Keenan Thank on you. there for you. Thank you. But they had some good matches as well. They massively overspent their budget, but I'm, I'm digressing a little bit there. But in summary, I was a big fan of Abyss. And I thought working against The Undertaker would be great. Okay. The bell sounds. And Abyss charges at Shark Boy, who ducks a clothesline and opens up with a flurry of right hands to the monster. The whip attempt that follows is futile, however, and Abyss sends shark boy into the ropes instead shark boy slides between the legs but is grabbed by the throat and he <laughs> as he makes it to his feet abyss is looking for a choke slam until shark boy bites his hand through the mask shark boy does his famous taunt which is the palm of the or the edge of the hand to the yeah. forehead which i will admit to liking um but holly he does give us something in a moment he does drop kick Abyss into the buckles and he treats the co-host with a lovely set of Sesame Street punches in the oh. corner. <laughs> yeah, fair Not enough. one you over yet? <laughs> no. Fair enough. Abyss shoves him halfway across the ring but cannot capitalise and finds himself eating a single-legged code breaker. Shark Boy goes up top and leaps into the arms of Abyss who catches him with ease. At this time we see the picture-in-picture picture of a blonde woman watching the match from backstage. Apparently her name is Goldilocks who we were informed seems to be the only person that can control the monster. Apparently she's a musician slash oh, okay. works in wrestling. I don't know. I'm not familiar with her, to be honest. <laughs> Back to the action and Abyss press slams Shark Boy to the canvas with ease and follows up with a crushing corner charge. Now that corner charge looked brutal. Yeah, it did. Torture rack position, but Shark Boy slips out the back, ducks a clothesline, but runs right into a black hole slam. Nobody, and I do mean nobody, hits that move like Abyss does. Bossman had his time with the Bossman Slam, but it isn't a patch compared to the Black Hole Slam from Abyss. The crowd reacts accordingly, and we get the one, two, three. Abyss is the winner by pinfall. Okay. Thoughts? Very short. Yep. Yep. Oh, I just don't care. Think care? No, because it's it's one of those matchups that I just look at and go, what is the point? Do you want me, is that a genuine question? Because I can yeah, answer fine. it. Yeah, fine. Go on, They want to make... Them, this just... is Abyss's first time on TV. They want yeah. him to look like a monster. Okay. So fair. you put him in there with someone, he kills him. Yeah. Mm, yeah. That's the point of it. And Shark Boy is a good sacrificial lamb for it. Because you look at him and go, oh, he's a kind of goofy character. It mm. makes sense that he'd get crushed. Okay. So that's cool. why. One out of five. Okay. Two. So what I saw in there was fine, but it wasn't long enough or had enough for me to do anything. Yeah, sure, so. sweet. So yeah, so two for me on this kind of show isn't actually great because I'd say 2.5 is a, okay. Yeah. So this was a bit like, eh, it wasn't quite long enough. It was fine what I saw, but nothing more than that. As Abyss makes his way Mm. back up the ramp, a defeated shark boy is approached by Popeye the fucking sailor man who's celebrating his 75th anniversary apparently. Mm. Minus the obvious tumours in his forearms and the stroke (laughs) he suffered, he isn't in bad nick really, is he old Popeye? (laughs) Popeye gives Shark Boy a hug, and we see we go to monochrome footage of the upcoming tag team title match. Yes, yes. And we go straight to that match, Holly, when we return. We do. We get America's Most Wanted versus Kid Cash and Dallas Mm. for the NWA World Tag Team titles. Don't worry, we touch upon these individuals. Okay, because I don't know any of them. Yes, you do. Do Oh, no. You know one of... No... Actually, you won't have seen one of them in... Okay, the one I thought you might know, I don't think we've actually covered an episode that he's been in, okay. but you'll see him a fair amount. And the other one is still going now, and you know him Do under I? a different name. Okay. We now get a match which has a 30-minute time limit as the NWA World Tag Team titles are on the line. There is so much I could say about these four men here, but I will try and be brief. Holly, do you know any of them? No. I'm stunned 
and surprise <laughs> no. and all of the above. <laughs> don't don't forget, I only know the rock, right? So you only know the rock. I only know right. one person. Forgot completely. Forgot. We'll start with the challengers. AMW who correct me sorry who correctly come out first as the challengers Uh which is good i like that they adhere to that wildcat chris harris was a top tier tag team worker in tna and yet is basically ridiculed as a meme wrestler from the cup of coffee he had in the wwe version of ecw as Braden walker his name might as well have been jobby mcjobberson or the charisma vacuum honestly it was so bad and i'm pretty sure he said as much himself he came in just with a generic singlet the most WWE, I'm giving you a generic name ever, was there for two matches, crap, left. But in TNA, he was the bigger of the two of AMW. Mm. So he was the one that had the slightly longer hair and was more physically imposing, Okay, if that helps. Because I know you won't be familiar with the other guy. Mm. And I, I don't think you'd have seen him in anything else. Seed him, seen him in anything else either. Speaking of, James Storm. He was a notch above Chris Harris, as he was in two top tag teams in TNA, firstly America's Most Wanted, and then Beer Money alongside Bobby Roode. Oh. Really good tag team. Yeah. He made a one-off appearance in NXT, but otherwise has never worked for WWE at length. Now for the champions. Obviously, I don't know how you answered my earlier question, Mm -hmm. but at the moment in time in 2004, Kid Cash was the best known of the four, having been a regular worker in ECW in the promotion's final few years and had some actually pretty enjoyable matches. So that leaves us with Dallas, a towering man who at this moment in time looked like a jacked up and stretched out Cyrus, a.k.a. Don Callis. Dallas would go on to be known as Lance Hoyt in TNA before his time in AEW saw him named the Murder Hawk Lance Archer. Red dreadlocks, hair, big guy, goatee. No? no? Okay, wow. No. You look him up, you'll like him. He was also <laughs> Vance Archer in the WWE for the small amount of time he was in there. You're going to Google him, aren't I you? I don't know. Let's Google him. What's so, his so, name? Um, go with Lance Archer, Murder Hawk. So Holly is now just Googling whilst we... Uh... Sorry. No, it's fine. I don't want to pause this recording. I want to see the Lance on-air Archer, reaction. Murder Hawk. Oh, it's Taking me to X, which I hate. Taking you to X. Why don't you just go to images? Yeah, nothing. What? Oh, him. I I can't see your phone, so I can't answer that. Oh, you seem underwhelmed. Yeah, no. Nice Let's have a look. See what you're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, looks right. like a poor man's Alistair Black. Except he's about 12 times taller than him. Well, yeah, I can't see And how much his height. more muscled, but yeah, fair enough. Hmm. Poor man Alistair Black. Alistair Black. <laughs> he's more like a poor we know man's I'm test. An, we know I'm an if you'd said Black poor man, man <laughs> test, I'd have said fair enough. Okay. He looks more like the love t- child of Alistair Black and Damien Priest. I don't need to imagine that kind of sex. <laughs> I'll be honest, I think that's going to be quite jarring for me to move on from that. But. Yes. Okay, well, I thought you'd be excited by that. Yeah. The bell sounds and Kid Cash shows how good he is at riling up the crowd as a number of the fans engage in heated words with one half of the tag team champions. He then proceeds to do the same on the hard camera side before he eventually locks up with James Storm. The two struggle for position until Storm grabs a waist lock and transitions to a hammer lock. Drop toe hold counter by Cash and he floats over to a front face lock. Storm reapplies the hammer lock as an escape. Cash rolls out but only into an armbar. Storm drags Cash back to the canvas, but he makes it to his feet once more and elbows free. Shoulder tackle by Cash. Drop down and leapfrog by Storm, who monkey flips Cash, causing him to land at quite a high angle Mm -hmm. on his shoulder and neck, I thought. Tanae says something interesting on commentary here that I reckon Holly is a fan of. A loss is a loss is a loss. Mm -hmm. If you lose by disqualification, you lose the titles. Yes. I knew that you'd win you over that one. Clothesline by Storm. I also knew that you sure as fuck wouldn't have heard him say it. Nope. Clothesline by Storm, and now Harris is the legal man. Harris whips Storm into Cash against the buckles, and the Wildcat sends him hard into the canvas with a bulldog after Cash hits the second set of buckles. Near fall, but Dallas breaks up the pin. Arm ringer by Harris, who tags Storm in, and he takes flight from the second rope, delivering a double axe handle to the joint. Boo. <laughs> You're not fan of the double axe handles. I thought I'd seen the last of them. Wait until the next show, Holly. You'll get your opportunity to have some booze there. <laughs> Cash slides between Cowboy's legs off a whip, grabs a waist lock, but Storm counters. O'Connor roll, but Cash holds on, and he stun guns Storm off the top rope as he looks to close the distance. Dallas the legal man, and he body slams Storm before assisting Cash with a back suplex into a moonsault. I like that. 
Yeah. Two count for the champs. Dallas begins standing on the neck of Storm as Tanae says they have to go to a commercial break. Boo. <laughs> Don't commercial break me in a match. Commercial break me in after between, a match. Because yeah. that's the bit I care about most. Work your show around that. Which apparently they do, but I guess it's a bit more difficult for an hour show, so I'll try and give them a little bit of leniency there. Back to the action, and Cash has the arms of Storm Butterfly, but we don't see the end result as we instead take into a replay of the cowboy connecting with a super kick. To the live action once more, and I have no clue what kid actually hit, but Storm is down and Cash is taking his time with it all. Lazy cover gets two. Storm looks to make the tag, but Cash cuts him off and applies a camel clutch, but he pulls on the hair rather than the chin. Ref just ignores that. Yeah. Body slammed by Cash, who signals that Dallas goes up top. The big man is sat on the buckles, and I'm now concerned as I see Cash signal the rotating of his hands, and there is no fucking way Dallas can do that. Cash climbs the ropes and goes crotch first into the face of Dallas, before climbing his shoulders and taking flight with a moonsault that finds no water in the pool a storm has rolled free. Did you like that? I I thought it was different. It was different. I didn't like it. Okay. And I'll tell you why I didn't like it. Mm. Because, and I don't like when anyone does this, Granted, it gives you a bit more height, but just standing on someone's trap seems like that would fucking hurt. Oh. Just I, like I know there's things in wrestling that are definitely going to hurt. Obviously, the impact, yeah. etc. But that just seems unnecessarily painful. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, why? Okay. It gives you like half a foot. Okay. So I'm getting I'm getting emotional, Holly. I didn't yeah. I really didn't like it. So you didn't like it when um, didn't Bliss used to stand on yep, Strowman's like shoulders? Don't like it because it looked ropey as well. Okay. Like a few times, I think Ember Moon did it off his shoulders as well, where she tried to hit that eclipse. Oh, don't yeah. like it. Okay. I'm trying to think of one where I've seen where I do like it. Oh. No, there is, there was one where I don't mind, and I think we actually did see it. Do you remember the Quebecers at WrestleMania? <laughs> Probably. Where um, Pierre was on top of the Mountie's shoulders uh-huh. and then got sent on off. That I liked because there was like there I don't know there's some for some reason there is a difference there and I can't quite put my finger on why. Is it because they uh, maintained physical contact because yes. didn't they keep their hands? Uh, yes. So yeah. I think that might well be it, and it always looked in full control. Yeah. True. Whereas with all the other ones I'm thinking of, it didn't. And to be fair to Cash, actually this one looked all right. There wasn't, but I just thought it was quite funny. I had to climb and go. Well, there's my sausage on your chin, yeah. so I'm just going to climb up one more. But anyway. Close line at the t- oh no, hot tag for Harris, and even Tanae calls it that from the booth. Dallas is in also, and Harris unloads with southpaw strikes. Close line attempt only sways Dallas, as does the second. Dallas looks to hit one of his own, but it's ducked, and Wildcat springs off the second rope with a crossbody that lands for a near fall. Not bad athleticism for a man of that size. Mm-hmm. Reversal of a whip sees Harris duck a clothesline, and he then connects with a flying one of his own that puts Dallas down on that occasion. The pin attempt is broken up by Cash, and now awful men, awful men, all four men are involved. Harris is sent to the floor as Cash is sent to the apron. Dallas scoops Storm up and hits the blackout moments before Cash hits a frog splash from up top. Lovely combo. Really, yeah. really nice combo. From out of nowhere, Harris spears Cash upside down, but Wildcat gets dropped with a big boot from Dallas right after celebrating. The big man looks to follow up with one on Storm, but he low bridges the ropes and Dallas is straddling the cables. Thinking on his feet, Harris rolls up Dallas from behind and holds on for the one, two, three. And we have new NWA World Tag Team Champions. Holly, what do you think of this match? I know you didn't know the four men, but... No, I didn't. I actually enjoyed this one. Yeah, I thought you would. Yeah, I was was alright with it. Wasn't too many people, it was only four. How did you label them in this? (laughs) Um, AMW... And then Cash and Dallas were actually easy to tell apart. Yes. Fair. So that was fine. Um, and also it was quite nice that both teams were wearing different colours. Because in the one that was Team Canada, they were all in the same. And then you oh, had yeah. Buddy Amazing Red that's in red. And then Gaza was red as well, wasn't it? It was very confusing. The only one that wasn't was Dutz. Yes. Yeah, um, I think you're right. I never so really thought of that. This was a nice bit of differentiation for me. It was quite nice. Okay. Yeah. Three out of five. Three stars. Oh, okay. I agree. I liked it. I thought it was well. Even the ending was fine. Yeah. And I don't think I've seen a finish like that for a while. So, yeah, it worked. Yeah. I was quite happy with that. And I thought, up to this point, I thought this that would have been your favourite match. Yes. But I also thought it would have been hindered by the fact that you... I thought for some reason the only one you might have known would have been Kid Cash. But mm. I then remembered we haven't actually seen him no. in any of the other shows. But I think you'll like his work. Okay. 
We return from commercial where we see Mike Tanay standing in the ring and he welcomes us to the judge for this week. So if any matches go to a draw, there's a judge involved. Mm -hmm. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is the American Dream, Doth the Road, baby. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Uh, fine. Okay. The cowboy hat wearing Texan makes his way to the ring, glad handing the fans, and we get a nice dusty chant from those in attendance. Tanay asked also Dusty worked creative as well for TNA for a while, okay. I should have said. And he came up with a couple of interesting inventions um, in terms of match types. I think he came up with the ultimate lockdown match, which I won't worry you with at the moment, although I can tell by your facial concern. <laughs> Tanay asked Dusty how great it is to be part of the debut episode of TNA Impact. And Dusty starts with a great deal of passion, but he does say, You talk about Impact over in 4,800... Million countries around the world, baby. What? <laughs> Forty-eight hundred million countries. Uh, yeah. You what? Have you seen Alan in the Hangover, where he's doing all the mental math at the casino? <laughs> yeah. That's what my brain was doing. I was going forty-eight million hundred. What is yeah. he talking about? He completely loses it. Really impassioned. I was like, that's yeah. great. Apologies for that that impression, because that was not a good dusty impression. But. 4,800 million countries. I had to rewind it three times because I was laughing because mm -hmm. it's ridiculous. But he committed to it. He didn't correct yeah, himself. No. Tradition lives at TNA, according to Dusty. This segues nicely into TNA and Dusty talking about the history of the NWA World Heavyweight title where Big Dust names the likes of Flair, Fez, Briscoe, Race and even AJ Styles are some of the names to have won the title over the years. TNA mentions Jeff Jarrett winning the title and this is met with a lot of boos. Dusty takes a more sombre tone as he says that he believed Jeff to be a brother of tradition, a brother in the old school ways of representing and respecting the NWA World Heavyweight title. Now we hear the My World entrance theme that introduces the King of the Mountain, Jeff Jarrett, who makes his way to the ring with guitar in hand, wearing all white with the NWA title over his shoulder, but most importantly, Holly, sunglasses mm -hmm. indoors. Yeah, Thoughts? no, get in the bin. Get in the bin. The thing is about his... The song of my world, my world. I actually quite like that bit, but it's the eater, eater mm. at the start that fucking gives me like, no. I get twitchy. I get, I want to start oh. smacking things, but I actually like the rest of the song, to be honest. Looks like the champion has some words for Dusty as he asked Dusty what he is even doing here. He said uh, that when he was 15 or 16, he respected Dusty. He looked up to Dusty. The crowd briefly stops booing to start chanting elbow 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 which makes you well aware of how they feel about jeff jarrett jeff says that he was grateful for the wisdom dusty imparted on him but that was 20 years ago and dusty was in the twilight of his career then jeff says dusty doesn't even realize that he's trying to help him by preventing him from making a fool of himself my question is where the fuck was jarrett when dusty said there were 400 million countries watching tna <laughs> jeff asks if it's the money, does he need money? Does he need 50 bucks or something? 100 bucks? 200 bucks? I don't know. Sell feet pics or something, I guess. Big Dusty, what can happen? <laughs> Jarrett says there is a place for people like Dusty in wrestling, but it isn't standing next to the current three-time NWA heavyweight champion. Dusty should not be in the ring. Jarrett says he will spell it out. It's high noon, and Dusty is the sheriff, and he's the new bandit in town, and if Dusty doesn't leave when he turns around, Jeff will run him out of town. Jarrett turns his back, and starts to strut mm -hmm. as he counts. When he gets to five, he says that Dusty... I'm doing the whole piece for you here, You're aren't I? You're getting the acting, yeah. Very much so. You hear my ankle explode as well, and I didn't even put pressure on it. Uh, sorry, where we go. He says that Dusty had better be gone when he turns around. When he does, he finds that Big Dust has followed him, step by exaggerated step, which I actually did quite enjoy, and begins comically slapping him with his cowboy hat before firing away with left jabs. But the champ begins firing back on the veteran. Now he has grabbed the guitar. Mm -hmm. Before he can do anything, however, he's stopped by Ron Killings, Yay. who has slid into the ring and grabbed him by the wrist. Killings unloads with right hands and makes a glancing connection on a corkscrew forearm. The attempted leg larret, however, sees the champion duck and Killings rebounds balls first off the top rope and I wince. That looked horrendous. Yeah. Yeah. With nobody there to help him, Jarrett explodes the guitar over Killings' head and takes his leave. BG James and Conan are late to the party as they slide into the ring as the champ has left the building. Yes, I've got a question in a minute, so I'll let you carry on and then I'll interject because I want to ask a question about who one of these people is. James has grabbed a microphone and says that Jarrett reminds him of Eddie Van Halen. Without his guitar, he's just a mortal man. 
That was a bit of a shit line, if I'm brutally honest. Okay. James says that come the next pay-per-view, Jarrett will have to answer to the three live crew. Is that supposed to be a threat? That's the name of their group. Oh. Shit. As the music begins to play, Tanay informs us that the newest member of the team, Shane Douglas, will be meeting with the Director of Authority, which is one of the most meaningless titles I think I could imagine. Oh no, it's Vince Russo. <laughs> What's your question? The guy that comes in and jabbers on the microphone. BG James? Who is that? Is that... Oh, you didn't is... know! Okay, right, there we go. Thank you. So, the top one there, I I mean, it's all spelt wrong, but I've put, is that Road Dog? Yeah, okay. you did. Good. And Conan, you actually saw in the episode of Thunder, because he was in that tag title match with Buff Bagwell. Mm. So, you have seen him. Yes. Uh, but yes, that is okay. BG James. Because I was writing, and then I just heard the voice rather than see the face, and I was like, that sounds like him. And he's obviously got a history with Jeff Jarrett as well, because he was the roadie, wasn't he, in WWF? Oh, obviously, yeah. So yeah, I forget this shit. <laughs> no, Come but on. but, you <laughs> but yes. remember the, yes. the two working together. So yes, a um, couple of things that I wanted to make on this particular aspect, and this touches upon what I mentioned at the start of the show, where they said they stepped away from the soap opera style oh, main right, events. Yeah. Mm. This is so soap opera. Yeah. Like, but also, Jeff Jarrett got a reputation because he was obviously the man behind the company at the time that he was able to kind of dictate how and when he wanted to be champion and had a very much a reign of terror. Like, you know, they talk about Triple H having yeah. in 2002, three. Jeff Jarrett, pretty much around that time, was doing the same in TNA. Not a fan. No. TNA, uh, it's TNA. Jeff Jarrett is fine. I'm not saying he's a bad worker, but he's, to me, best used in small doses. I don't want to see him dominating the title scene. Doesn't work for me personally. Every now and then, sure, mm. but it was always the same thing. Like, he would win the title. He'd lose it to AJ Styles. He'd win it back from AJ Styles doing something cheap. He would then lose it to Ron the Truth Killings. He would then win it back from Ron the Truth right. Killings. So, Ron Killings was the first ever, because well, he hadn't been the champion yet, I don't think. he. I think at the pay-per-view, I don't know if it's the one that they're talking about coming up, Killings beats him for the title, but it's in a square ring, so maybe this had already happened actually. So okay. I, I think it might have been two thousand two, three, um, and he, in the process of doing so, became the first African American NWA champion. Oh wow! Our truth. Oh, so, I was very happy to see our truth. And this honest. was after the time where we saw him in yes. Get Rowdy, and again he's linked with Road Dog yes, again. So true, there's, yeah. it's all all linking all up. Nice. My God, his athleticism, like mm. that corkscrew forearm, Honestly. barely hit him, but fuck me, that was mm -hmm. ridiculous to see. Really good. But I knew you'd be pleased when you saw him. I was yeah. like, there's no way you're not going to recognise yeah. him. Yeah. Okay. We see monochrome footage of Mike Tanay talking about his memories of the X Division matches when he coined the phrase, it isn't about weight limits, it's about no limits, which, again, I'll admit is very good. We see footage of AJ Styles becoming the first X Division champion. We see more footage as we get cuts to Jerry Lynn and Scott Hudson talking about the matches also. You're familiar with Jerry I Lynn? I know him yeah. now, yeah. That's, do you know what? This is one of my favourite things about the podcast. Yeah. Is that I just know more people than just The Rock. Well, yeah, I was actually trying to be like nice and a little bit, not mushy <laughs> about it, but it's one of my favourite things where you then go, oh, yeah, I know this guy. Mm -hmm. I like this guy. Or even the ones that go, oh, yeah, I know him. I hate him. Yeah. It's, it's introducing you to things. It's yeah. like, this is going to sound so patronising. Oh, I really don't okay. mean it to sound this way. But mm -hmm. like, if and when I ever have a kid, right. and they get into wrestling, and then I get to introduce them to some of the people that I really like, and uh -huh. they become fans as well, it's that same kind of imparting, it feels like it sounds arrogant, imparting wisdom, or imparting knowledge and exposing mm. these things to people is great. I really like that. So it's nice that I get to do this with you, which is my point. But uh, yeah, if you could know more people than The Rock, that would be great. It would be really helpful, actually. <laughs> Just one or two? Yeah. Hey, if I can know who Jerry Lynn is, so... That's true, that is true. Someone had to. Nah, that's unfair. Jerry Lynn was pretty good. We see one particularly spectacular... Judgment Day. Sorry, I was going back to his thing in WWF and that promo. <laughs> we see one particularly spectacular clip as Jerry Lynn uses a ladder. Sorry. I'm so sorry. That really tickled me. <laughs> Do you remember him doing that? <laughs> Fucking awful. Fucking awful. Oh, God. That really tickled me. Uh... uh Okay, sorry, I try and contain myself. <laughs> we see one particularly spectacular clip as Jerry Lynn uses a ladder to sling Eric Young over the ropes into the floor outside. So I wasn't mentioning the moves, but I saw that and thought, I don't think I've ever seen anyone do that before, but it looked really good. Jeremy Borash says that this is the next step in the evolution of the business, and he's probably not wrong, as we see a lot of these matches in the independent scene, like 
all the same kind of moves or to the point where it's overdone if mm. i'm being perfectly honest because you can smatter this kind of stuff in but with any type of match you need to have the variety there so you're not seeing the same pace yes. over and over again and that's one of the things that i would occasionally criticize progress for it's not too obvious because they have enough variety in, yeah. there in the matches but i remember i think it was the last show where i think in every match bar one we saw a suicide dive every match yeah i was like just have a word with each other so you're kind of doing different things but that's maybe maybe that's just a me thing but i feel like there's probably a few people out there that feel similar the music is very very electronic and retro and feels more fitting with the 90s i thought agreed the voiceover mentions that the current champion kazarian has a number of challenges on the horizon kazarian you've actually have you seen wrestle in person because he was at AEW. He's in TNA now, I think. Oh. Again, he's gone back there. But he was the one half of the first ever AEW Tag Team Champions. So, there you okay. go. We cut to the backstage area where we see the franchise Shane Douglas welcome the TNA, TNA Director of Authority, Vince Russo, to ask him who the four participants will be in the upcoming match to determine the number one contender for the X Division title. I, I could not stop looking at Bro. His, his eyebrows and sideburns here. Ridiculous. So, so much. The thing you don't understand, bro. Russo, <laughs> Russo says that this is the land of opportunity in TNA, and you would never have guessed he was from Long Island with that accent, would you, Holly? That's not your impression. Ru- uh, honestly, I could go on for days. Russo said, "Russo, why the fuck?" Can I? Russo says that says Russo Is says okay? she sells seashells on the Russo shore. Russo says that. The, Oh, this dear. is a real the fucking shoes. issue for me. All right, Sean Connery. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, Miss Moneypenny. Russo says that the four people <laughs> came up to him and requested to be in the match. We know three of them, and he knows the fourth, and he can't wait for us to find out. Hang on, though. When the fuck do we learn about the first three? Yeah, I, I, absolutely not a clue. Even when they say their names, I still don't know who they are. <laughs> I guess we know the three men, as they are already stood in the ring, but the viewers at home sure wouldn't have known that. Nope. So the match, main yes. event of the evening, mm. X Division contest, which I don't think is a bad move on their part. No. We've got Chris Sabin, Michael Shane, Elix Skipper, and then the mystery guest, yeah. mystery opponent, is the phenomenal one, yes. AJ Styles. So at least I knew one person. So Holly, I'll yeah. give you tidbits on the three men in this match that you don't know. Ooh. Elix Skipper, aka Primetime, was a youngster in WCW when they closed and moved to TNA shortly after it was formed. He was perhaps one of, if not the most, has one of the... Sorry, let me start that again. Elix Skipper, a.k.a. Primetime, was a youngster in WCW when they closed and moved to TNA shortly after it was formed. He has perhaps one of, if not the most memorable moment in TNA history in a cage match where he walked along the top edge of the fence to hit a Super Hurricane Rana on his opponent. And when I say the edge of the cage, it's not like the WWE ones where, you know, they used to have the thick kind of steel on top. It's like a mesh. And he tiptoed across the corner, started to lose balance. Oh, that's that guy that does across across the ropes and all that. Okay, now in my head I can go. Because he hit that moment and everyone went, oh my God. And I remember at the time it was insane. It's still insane, to be fair. Because one slipped the wrong way Mm -hmm. and you were going like 25 foot into the crowd. Or 25 foot down and into the crowd, I should say. It was one of the most crazy things I've ever seen. It really was. Chris Sabin was a mainstay of the X Division and would go on to form a top tag team alongside Alex Shelley as the Motor City Machine Guns. In fact, I think they've recently signed with the WWE. Okay. So very good tag team. Very good tag team. Speaking of the WWE, you will not have heard of Michael Shane before, but does he look familiar to you at all? No. Should he? Maybe not. But his cousin does, and he is currently running NXT. Yes, Michael Shane is Shawn Michaels' cousin. Oh. And if you look at him now, you go, I can see it. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Rounding off the four is the kingpin of the division, AJ Styles. And this will be your first time hearing his TNA theme, which was always one of my favourites. Really oh. liked it. Holly, <laughs> tell me your thoughts on this look for AJ Styles, please. <laughs> I don't know AJ Styles, aside from... The long tights, the minivan mum haircut, like that's all I know him as. So this is very odd. Really short hair, short shorts, short short shiny shorts. Short shiny shorts. Yeah. And double hoop earrings. Bold. Fucking bold. 
Take your earrings out when you go wrestle, please. To me, and it's funny to say this, as this is how he looked for so many years, it seems odd to me now, seeing him like that. Okay. Partly as I'm so accustomed to the longer hair and beard, and partly because in 2004, from the neck up, he looks like a Mancunian landlady presiding in a rough <laughs> public house. <laughs> Okay. Tell me when I'm telling lies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Seeing how long he's left on the show, I know it'll be fairly swift, and I weep for my note taking. The four men begin to oh, actually okay. Before oh, we go into it, okay. You know AJ Styles. Yes, I do. You personally, know what yeah. he can. Yeah, personally, you're yeah, best course. mates with him. You're right. Age. Besties. You call him um, Alan. Um, <laughs> weird that that's his first mm-hmm. name, isn't it? Yes. You're familiar with his work. You know what he can do now. You know he's got yeah. like he's athletic now. Yeah. So what must you thought he was capable of in this era? Well, Bearing in mind this is twenty years ago. Yeah. See, that's upsetting. That is upsetting. But yeah, knowing what he can do fairly recently, or in the last couple of years, I was like, oh, okay. Are we going to get more? Like, as in more like agile stuff? Because he's already pretty agile. But because he's younger, mm-hmm. so oh, or it could go the other way and be like, maybe he wasn't as good as he is now. I don't know. Fair, so. fair. And I kind of, I'd finished this in one sitting, whereas you hadn't. No. And I actually said, I think you'll enjoy the main event. I blame Shark Boy. I had to take a break after fucking Shark Boy. Poor Shark Boy. No. Oh, okay. No. And fuck Ventura <laughs> while we're at it. Oi. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. No, I like Jess. The four men begin to brawl as the bell sounds. Sabin is whipped to the ropes but holds on and drop toe holds Styles over the middle rope as he charges in. He shifts his attention to Michael Shane and opens up with punches until Shane counters into a pop-up gut buster. He turns round and eats a big boot from Styles. Skipper sees his opportunity and springs off the back of Sabin, kicks off the shoulder of Shane and hits an ugly hurricane runner on Styles. Cool idea but too many areas it could fail but still not bad overall when you consider it. Yeah. And that's the thing with Elix Skipper. He always has to now try and do something impressive. It's like the Kofi Kingston Royal Rumble spot. Uh, he does a couple of things and now that's his thing. You've okay. got to do it every time. Saban charges Skipper and clotheslines both he and Prime Time over the top and to the floor. In the ring, Shane is offloading right hands to Styles. Body slam attempt sees AJ slip out the back and grab a waist lock. Two elbows help Shane escape and he hits the ropes. Drop down and leapfrog by Styles, Holly's a fan, yep. who follows with a crisp drop kick that lands right on the money and AJ Styles hit a lovely drop kick back in the day. Holly looks confused. I don't even know where I am in my nose. The I crowd, really don't. The crowd allowed for this one, and to be fair to them, they have been good throughout. Right hands by Styles, who hits the ropes, but as he returns, Sabin hits has springboarded off the top rope from the apron and scores with a missile drop kick on the phenomenal one. Skipper flips over the top rope into the ring and connects with a lariat on Sabin, which wasn't the cleanest, but does get a two count. Running crossbody by Sabin gets a two count, but prime time bridges out, which is impressive, and he hits a lovely spinning back kick with swagger that levels Sabin. Mm. Two count off the cover as Shane has him by the ankle, pulling him off. Skipper misses the Inseguri attempt. Right hands from Shane and he hits a counter wheelbarrow suplex. Shane hits the ropes, but Styles trips him from the outside and drags him to the floor. Suplex attempt by Styles is blocked and Shane connects with one of his own on the floor. Ow. You've lost me in your notes again, haven't you? I don't even understand where I am. I'll, I'll pick it up at some point. Okay. But it's, I think as well, because it was hard for me because half these people, well, two thirds, two thirds, three quarters. There it is. Jesus. The maths has gone. <laughs> yeah, you can't count six <laughs> twice, that's you spent. Like, because I didn't know who they were, I've tried to identify them in, like, a different way. Oh, God, so, like, I'm really concerned. Michael Shane had yellow tights on. So, yellow tights. But he don't get another mention, because I then, at some point, use his name, and I'm like, I've <laughs> I've lost it, basically. Love I'm that. absolutely fucked. What we should do at some point is like have oh, it, God. do something for charity <laughs> and put your notes up for sale or something just so you can send them on to people and see what the fuck, see if they can work out just what's going on. put my notes online and people can try and work out what match it was from my <laughs> absolute shit show of notes. Yeah, exactly. What event, what show <laughs> what was it? What was this? I won't even know. No, so. exactly. Back in the ring, Skipper connects with a satellite Uranagi slam, which I actually thought was Saban connecting with a flatliner, and this still gets a two until Shane breaks the count. Skipper looks for the highlight reel but finds it countered and is hit with an impaler DDT that gets two until Styles breaks up the pin. After a few right hands, Styles charges at Shane but is elevated up and onto the apron. 
He flips over the shoulder tackle attempt back into the ring, ducks a clothesline attempt and then springboard moonsaults off the middle rope, lands on his feet and hits reverse DDT. One, two, no. Sabin breaks it up. You a fan of that move? Yeah, I did. I loved that. seeing AJ do that. Yeah. Wild swing from Sabin is ducked and AJ has the waist. O'Connor roll is followed all the way through back to a standing position and Sabin elbows free. Springboard tornado DDT from Sabin on Styles hits hard, near full. Sabin runs and backflips off Skipper in the corner before connecting with a seated drop kick. He turns and runs straight into an overhead throw from Shane and for a moment the action slows as Shane climbs to the top rope. When we get there, or sorry, when he gets there, however, he's given a shove by Stars that sees him land crotch first on the top cable. I Holly, found where I am. Holly's found it. She literally oh. fist bumped there. Yay. From the nearest corner, Skipper has climbed the ropes and walks across to Michael Shane, who he hits a hurricane runner on, sending both men tumbling to the floor. Pretty cool, actually. Yeah. Back in the ring, and Stars lands on his feet from a German suplex attempt. Very nice. Irish whip attempt is blocked with a back elbow by Sabin. He hits the ropes, but Styles sidesteps, sending Sabin on a suicide dive that connects with Elix Skipper on the floor. Styles is alone in the ring, and he takes a moment to scan the fans before focusing back in. Running somersault plancher from AJ Styles. Sabin rolls Shane back into the ring, but is caught with a kick as he re-enters. Sabin counters a whip and lifts Shane onto his shoulder, but he escapes and runs him shoulder first into the ring post. Oh, take a big ass drink at this point. The only drink of the whole show. I know. Shane begins t uh, tuning up the band. Did you notice that? They even said he was tuning up the band. Oh. There you go. Because you can't have your own identity. No. Star springs off the top rope and rolls through a sunset flip, picks Shane off the canvas and connects with a Stars clash for the one, two, three. AJ Styles is the number one contender for the X Division title. Before I go on to the next bit, what did you think of that move to do the sunset flip? Yeah, I pick like up? that. Really good, wasn't really it? Really like that. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that the Stars Clash as a move in general really has you fucking worried. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, fair. Just a tad. Yeah, I can I can imagine. I can imagine. Thought, uh, well, actually, no, sorry, before we go on. As the bell sounds, Kazarian makes his way to the ring and gives Stars a big thumbs up. We get another shoddy fireworks display mm -hmm. as AJ and Kazarian exchange words and the show comes to an end. What did you think of this match? I enjoyed it. I think I would have. I I do think I would have enjoyed it more if I wasn't trying to make notes from it. Okay, yeah, fair. Purely because I didn't know half three quarters. Of, I'll do it again. <laughs> three quarters of the people Seven in it. Seven twelfths. And and also on commentary, they they do that thing again that I they don't say what anything is, or they do little bits, yeah. but not. I need Jesse. I need Jesse telling me what everyone is doing. Jess wouldn't know what the fuck to call these. <laughs> no, moves. I know. But do you know what I mean? Like sometimes it's, and then I have to write it down in a way that I go, I know oh, what that is. That's that's this, which proven by my notes today didn't fucking work. Didn't fucking work at all. And I think because I follow along with, so I've yeah, I've literally here got like yellow tights, but because you call them the proper name. I'm like, who the fuck is that? Who is that? But that will come with... It's... So next time we see these people, you'll at least know them. Sure. So you won't... Well, you'll probably at least be more <laughs> well positioned to go, again. oh, I'll write his name yes. down this time. Yes. So that's usually a first case yes. introduction to If them. they could just have some one-on-one -on -one matches that they aren't did. just Shark Boy and... Abyss. Fake Kane, then yeah, that'd be great. Say that again? No, I know it, I don't know you. <laughs> Fake Kane. <laughs> I know it, I know you. You work circles around Kane. Um, I gave that a three out of five. Okay, three point seven five. Okay. I knew all the people in there. The match pacing was fine. Yeah. I thought it worked. It showcased the division well, yep. which was their whole point. If you think about the the show, the amount of times they mentioned X Division and they were kind of pinning this as being, you know, this is different. This is yep. our creation. Why not have it in the main event? And it worked. Yeah. I think a lot of the matches they did on the show served a purpose. So the opening one was a bit of a mess, I'll be honest. That's yeah. just kind of, oh, let's get some people on there to show some wacky moves and kind of get some interest. Yes. Then the next match is, let's make Abyss look like a monster. Done. Yeah. Tag team title match, so it links again to the NWA heritage. It shows, and they get a title change on the very first episode. So if True. they're changing it on TV, True. what are they going to do the next time round? Yeah. And then, again, main event showcases the X Division. Um, I was tempted at one point to give it a four, but the reason why I didn't is because... I'm also aware that they were rushed for time. And even though the pacing of it felt fine, given a bit more time, I think they could have done 
few extra bits which would have improved it for me, mm. but I, I still think it was a really good outing. So 3.75 was my score on that. What would you class the overall show as? I have rescored this about three times. Really? Okay. Yeah. I want to know each iteration of the score, if you'd be so kind. So when I finished, I was like, oh, that's not for me. Like, I'm out. That was awful. Three out of ten. And then I went back to it and I went, yeah, but look at the... There weren't that many matches. But two of them, I'd given like three out of five. So... I then felt that the four out or you know the lower score was a bit ridiculous because I thought like, oh, I just think of it as a whole thing. So I rescored it. I have settled on five out of ten, just middle. I've got high hopes, but I just there's something about it that just didn't. I I blame fucking Shark Boy. I'll be honest. I feel like it just pissed <laughs> me off. I feel like it just annoyed me. And yeah, he's actually a very good worker. Oh, I'm sure he is. I just, I, yeah, I don't know. I didn't hate it. Didn't love it. And yet you like the hurricane. Yeah, I know. I know. They're the they're the same. Mm. They are the same. Mm. But I know you can't agree to that because then it goes against your logic. But they are. Oh no! Yeah, it, I don't know. Just you know. Yeah, fair enough. But for me, I would score it five out of ten as well. Okay. I thought based on what I knew, you thought of the show because mm-hmm. you kind of mentioned that it no, was yeah. an absolute slog for you. Yeah. Which is mad because it was forty six minutes. I know. I thought you were going to be around three. Yeah. I did think that's where you'd end up. I just thought I had to be fair and come back to it and go, actually, two of those are three out of five. I'm, I can't give a I can't give a whole show less than five if I'm giving I two of can. the matches over half. Yeah, fair. Oh, that's a very pragmatic way of looking at it. Oh, thank you. I and think. I'm glad that you kind of repositioned your thought on yeah. it, I guess, overall, which is, is very big of you. Thank you. Don't you. Like no, I don't to... do that a lot. No. no, you don't. But again, you're arguing with yourself at this point yes. rather than someone else. Otherwise, we'd still be arguing now yes. on the actual result of it. Now, this part is quite interesting. Okay. Because we've obviously got Holly's outfit of the night. Mm. S- slim pickings. Um, yeah. I've got... Um, <laughs> so I like to try and guess. And I didn't write it down in this one because I was like, I don't know what the fuck she's going to pick. So Shark Boys are given. Um, Abyss had a solid look, I thought. And now we're going to struggle. Okay. I'm going to be upset if you say Ron Killings because um, it doesn't make sense. Uh, who else was on the show that would look good? Kid Cash, maybe? i say Kid Cash was maybe in the mix. Okay. Uh, I don't know if anyone from the main event looked particularly outlandish. So what, what have you got? Who Did you have a shortlist? Do you want to read what I've written? <laughs> God. Mm-hmm. Honestly, fucking no one. Shark Boy for a laugh. So I was right. Honestly. I that took me so long. There was no one in there has good gear. No. no and I get it, I get it, and it's not always about the gear. But I, I sat there for fucking ages going, There's no one. And normally as I go through yeah. I will go, Oh, let me write this one down. Yeah. Like the next one we do, oh, it's peppered with oh, I've got honestly <laughs> the comments I've got for it as well. <laughs> so but this one was just that's really why I slim settled on the fucking abyss. Pickings. The only reason I put Sharp Boy there was because it's just funny. It's ridiculous. Abyss would would get it for me just because I think that was probably a decent look for him yeah. and the character. Yeah, so that's fair. purely why and it was a little bit more than just the rest of them. Because if I was just picking an outfit based on, if I take that match out of the equation, yeah, I really struggle. Like yeah. I said, maybe think Kid Cash because just because I'm familiar with that look and mm-hmm. that works for him. But beyond that, that's my only logic. Or Dusty, yeah coming out as a cowboy and we know you like a cowboy but granted at the time i thought you'd be more receptive to this than you actually were i thought you'd think it was chaos i did think that would be the case but now you're removed from the review side of it Mm -hmm. open to more tna stuff in the future yeah i'd happily watch more okay well that's the main thing it hasn't scarred you for long well (laughs) true yeah i'd happily watch more i just i think now i'd like to see something a little bit later on okay Okay. And kind of see how it compares to what I can compare it to, if you know what I mean. The show I want to show you is from 2005. So it's only the... Well, I want to show you loads of stuff, but this show in particular is from 2005. So it's only a year later. So I don't know. I don't think that's different enough for what you're looking for. So I'll try and bear that in mind. But I think you'll you'll certainly enjoy the match I'm talking about. And I can't, Mm -hmm. to be honest, remember much of the rest of the card. I think I actually have it on DVD somewhere as well, but I'm not going to start sifting through it now. 
Any other thoughts? No. In general, or just no. something to, to do with the show? Nothing yeah, no, else. That... It was all right. Just okay. yeah, really. Thank you for recommending that watch. That's really joyful for me. You're welcome. It wasn't me, but I know you're not aiming that at me. No. I can tell by the passive aggressive eye rolling that I saw there. So Jamie, I'm getting like flack from your decisions here, mate. <laughs> Um, but I, I thought it was good. I enjoyed mm-hmm. it. And it's one of the only shows, if not the only show, I've done in one sitting. So okay. that's something. Yeah. Um, but I hope everyone else enjoyed the culmination and the conclusion of episode number 40, our yeah. first little dalliance into TNA. Uh, until next time, guys, take care. Do you not want me to do the uh, socials? Let's pretend I didn't just do that, okay? <laughs> We're going to go back and do the socials. I mean, usually I say, do you want to do the socials? And he goes, uh, no. Well, I don't want to do them. But so, no, 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 no. It's the spotlight's on you, chick. You pick it up. Go for it. <laughs> Wintwicepod at gmail.com. And then everything else is Wintwicepod. And what can they do on the Gmail? Send you um, emails. About? Anything they like, really. Show suggestions would be ideal, to be honest. <laughs> no, um, I think anything. Yeah, I'd, I'd do the same on Instagram, to be fair, because Holly loves it. She says, I don't get enough communication from you guys. I've had some really nice ones, so I'm, you have. I'm all right. You have, I'm just saying. Really nice Pepper ones. her. Pepper her with it. All right. Um, can, I, can I cut the bit I just did earlier and just pop it at the end? <laughs> no, I'm going to have to do the whole thing. I need to come up with a more suave and slick ending to these shows. Bye, done. Well... Okay, we'll pretend I'm just going to no sell like I didn't do it. So, hopefully, guys, you've enjoyed episode number 40 of the uh, Winterwise Wrestling Podcast. And until the next one, take care. Bye. <laughs> until next time, this has been a Winterwise Wrestling production. Peace out.